Hi everyone and thank you so much for joining us today as we share in the book of John chapter 7 verse 1 through 10. Uh, this message is called I will do it in God's time. I'll do it in God's time. John chapter 7 verse 1 says, And after this Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders were there looking for a way to kill him. Uh, the Jews uh, had criticized Jesus for his ministry and there's many that did not understand him or where he was coming from and they looked at him as a threat. So Jesus said he was going to stay in Galilee because he understood something about timing. He understood that there's spiritual wisdom when it comes to timing. If Jesus would have gone to Judea, he already knew that there was people that hated him, hate him so much that they would want to beat him, arrest him, and put him on the cross. There was crowds there that had different motives that uh, would have um, looked to harm Jesus. Now, Jesus understood that the cross was in his future. He understood that the cross was the will of God. But he also understood the timing. I believe that that's where spiritual wisdom comes. Where, you know, just because God is with us, we don't purposely try to push things outside of God's time. We're not here to put God to the test. It's not here trying to prove who God is in our lives. And so then we try to do something that God is not in. I'll never forget. Uh, one preacher said it uh, best. He said that so many times we're asking God to bless what we're doing instead of looking for what God is blessing. And this kind of discernment comes when we try to see things from God's point of view. We have to understand that we will do it, but we're going to do it in God's time. If we read in verse 2 and 3, it says, But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee, go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. And verse 4 says, No one who uh, wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. I, I want you to notice here that his brothers uh, are trying to, to help Jesus out. And they're telling him, go to Judea so the disciples can see your miracles and you can show yourself. You know, when you look at John chapter 7, this chapter that we're reading, there's a overarching theme. And we'll review uh, on other uh, messages how you see that there's people that have a void inside of them and they're looking for things or people to fill those emptiness. And here we see that. We see uh, men that don't even believe in Jesus almost wanting to prove who he is and they want to feel that emptiness and that void and so here they're trying to look for this stage they're trying to prompt jesus outside of the will of the father and so they're they're uh, trying to to do something with their own human reasoning and i want to say this about trying to fill those voids in our life uh that are empty we know that we live in a broken planet and this world offers many ways to feel emptiness, our emptiness in our life, to fill those voids. We know, we know it's wrong for us not to get involved with addictions. We know that there's habits uh, that this world uh, gives, wants us to drown ourselves in sorrow, wants us to become so codependent on narcotics and others that, that, uh, we lose control and sight of what's going on in our life. Get stuck in relationships that really are, are tearing our families apart. And those things don't feel that inner emptiness. You, it's obvious. Addictions and habits only make 
bad things go worse. And it's the wrong way to deal with those needs. But you know, I'll tell you, for believers, it's obvious. We don't want to fall into addictions. We know that we don't want to get into bad relationships. But many times as believers, we can also exhibit some some traits that, you know, they look good. They sound right. But they don't have God's blessing on them. We have ways to, to create things that, that, uh, that look uh, acceptable and they look like they're, uh, they're, they're, they're popular and, and mainstream. But in the end, God's not really there. Trying to market ourselves, trying to put ourselves in platforms that God never intended. Hey, listen, we are the children of the light and God has put us on a city that is set on a hill and we do cry out from the mountaintops of who Jesus is. I'm not talking about those platforms. I'm talking about the, the, the subtle ways that we're trying to fill voids of looking for prestige, looking for popularity, some looking for financial possessions trying to monetize and market the gospel that was never meant to be sold, but it was freely received and now freely given. And we, we do it with this cover-up of Christianity. And God is not in those humans' plans. That's not God's will. That's men's strategy. And here we hear what man, man's strategy looks like. They go to Jesus with man-made solutions and they say, Here, this is what you need to do. It might not be the right thing. It's not the right timing. But this sounds good. This sounds right. You know, I, I want to take a moment because uh, you see that the brothers of Jesus do not even believe. Uh, if you ask yourself, why would they not believe? I, I have a take on it. I think the reason why they, they didn't believe who Jesus was, that he was the true Messiah, is because they grew up with him. And there was something very familiar. We have to be very careful when we take sacred things and we make them familiar. We have to be very careful when we take divinity and we treat it like it's any old thing. Jesus is still the King of Kings. He's still the Lord of Lords. And we don't want to get so close to, to the miracle that we're, we become far from it. And we miss the wonder. We don't want to be so close to Jesus that we can't even see who He is. I know there's people that have, uh, uh, have a background that's religious. They have a background of having church and God in their life. But now they have no relationship. They could tell you everything about the denomination. They could tell you everything about the organization. They're connected. They're related to everyone. But they have no relationship with Jesus Christ, which is the most important thing. I'll give you a spoiler about Jesus' brothers. Later on, they completely believe. They see who He is and they're transformed. Later on in the New Testament, you even read the book of James and the book of Jude. Two of his brothers that write uh, books in the New Testament because they were so persuaded. When they saw him die on that cross, sacrifice everything and be resurrected, that was all they would need so that they would give their life completely to this. Well, today we can see God's love and his sacrifice. And we can give ourselves completely to this. Now, going back to, to this human strategy where they're telling Jesus what to do. You see, I believe that sometimes we get so familiar with the things of God that God's power doesn't look powerful anymore. His supernatural help doesn't seem significant because maybe the timing is off. Maybe God hasn't answered as quickly as we wanted him or the way that we had planned for it. So now we start planning our own power strategy, our own supernatural uh, way of doing things. 
But can I tell you, anytime we take problems and issues out of God's hands and put them in our hands, we are limited. We need to put it back in God's hands and reconnect with Him because that's the only power that we truly, truly have. You see, I believe that when we try to use these human strategies, these these uh, ideas that we try to uh, do on ourse- ourselves, it's our attempt to just say, God, here, I'm trying to help you out. But I can tell you this, our ideas are not God's ideas and they don't make things better. God's wisdom, God's perspective, His plan is bigger, His plan is better. I, I, I want us to look at this advice just for a, a few moments here in John chapter 7. This is the advice that Jesus' brothers uh, gave him. They said, so you need to go out there. Even though people hate you, you need to get out there so that the disciples can see some more miracles. Because you need a bigger crowd. You need more people. Give them what they want. And, and they said, don't act in secret. Because you need a better strategy. Show yourself because uh, you need better advertising. You need better marketing. Do you, do you hear the humanistic uh, strategy in this? The, the thinking? I don't know why, but uh, inside of me, I, I feel like I've, I've got to take a pause here. Because this is a great scripture uh, for two people. Uh, people who are getting bad advice from people who don't even believe in Jesus. You need to consider the sources of where you get your advice. And you need to still do the right thing. Honor God and obey God's word in spite of bad advice and bad counsel. And we are bombarded. Can I tell you? uh, Instagram influencers uh, don't have a right to tell us how to live our life when they're trying to navigate themselves. Can I tell you, models from Madison Avenue do not have a right to tell us what we should look like or feel like when they're still trying to navigate their own emotions. When it comes to getting advice, we need to go to the Creator I'll take it this far. Our young people, our students, do not need the, the violence of video games so that they can find that inner fulfillment inside of them and live in a, uh, uh, a virtual reality when life is outside all around them where they can connect with it. It's very, very important that we consider who's speaking into our life and we recognize that we can go to a creator who has the, the handbook and the manual of our life. And, and uh, the other thing I, I want to mention is that these are uh, great scriptures for anyone who's receiving bad advice from family. Now you know that Jesus understands what it feels like to be surrounded by bad family advice well that's my cousin that's my brother that's my sister that's wonderful we love them they love you but they're limited they're limited in life because of their perspectives maybe they had a bad relationship so now they're going to tell you that all relationships are bad you can't trust anybody don't uh, don't make yourself vulnerable to love well You don't want to put your future and your hands in the hands of somebody that's been hurt. You've got to put your future and your life in the hands of the one that knows how to heal the hurt. And so it's important to trust Jesus. This advice that we see, Jesus has a response in uh, chapter 7 verse 6. And he says, therefore, Jesus told him, my time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. He said, but my time is not here. He said, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that it wor- that its works are evil. So you go to the festival. 
I'm not going to go to the festival because my time has not yet fully come. After he had said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went, not publicly, but in secret. I want you to see, Jesus was focused on the thought that it wasn't his right time. You know, if Jesus prioritizes time, I think we should too. And I believe that the answer that Jesus gave should be the answer that we need to give today. I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it in God's time. God's time will come. It might not be yet, but God's time will come. If there's anything that I want you to listen to me and receive, is that there's a difference between God's will and God's timing. See, Jesus knew that if he went into Jerusalem, went into Judea, that certainly there was going to be people that were going to try to put him on a cross, but it wasn't time yet. It wasn't the will of God for him, for him to go to the cross right at that moment. He knew it was in the future, but it just wasn't the right time. Please understand, because I believe it takes a spiritual discernment to understand God's timing. You say, well, I, I feel God really wants me to do this. Well, wonderful. He's revealed a purpose in your life. He's revealed a next step. And ask Him, ask Him, what's my next step? But then also ask Him, when do you want me to do it? Well, I know it's God's will for me to get married. Yes, but you got to seek the right time. I, I feel that it's God's will for me to move and make this change. Understand that. But I need God's timing. You see, God will always, whenever He gives us a word of direction, His word will always honor or, uh, uh, His his commandment and His request, His direction will always uh, coincide with His Word and with godly counsel from the shepherds, pastors, leaders in our life. You say, well, I, I feel like it's God's will for me to minister or start this ministry. Yes. But I want to get God's timing. I believe there's somebody here that you've been looking for God's timing so much that you've been dismissing the calling of God. There's been shepherds in your life that have told you it's the right time. God's waiting for you. Well, you also have to understand because we don't want to go ahead of God, but we also don't want to get stuck and be disobedient and miss the windows that God has. Because I'll tell you this, God's windows of opportunity don't last forever. There's doors that are open. And we have to walk in obedience. But it requires a spiritual discernment to understand God's timing. I'm so thankful that you joined me today. I, I feel that I want to say a special prayer for you as you look for God's timing in your life. I pray that you would seek that. Please join me in this prayer. God, I pray right now for everyone that's listening to us. You said that the fear of the Lord would give us wisdom for every decision that we make. So I pray that we would go before you with an attitude that honors you and seeks you for the truth that you can give. God, I pray that you would give us discernment to make decisions not based on our emotion, not based on anger, but based on your revelation. God, we want to make some godly choices. I pray that you would take the foolishness out of our heart that would uh, make us do something that's impulsive and help us to recognize that there's error in just being emotional. We've got to stand on truth. Open up our eyes so we can clearly see and consider consequences of our decisions. I pray that we can listen to the, the pastors, ministers, godly counselors that you've put around us. Give us strength to reject ungodly counsel. People that are coming with their own 
perspectives. Your word says that there's many plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's counsel that will stand. So I pray right now that you would open up our eyes and help us to understand your timing and your will. I pray that you would show us what to do. Speak loud, speak clear, so that we could understand your time. And we, want to go, we don't want to go ahead of you. And we don't want to stay stuck behind. We want to move in step with you. I pray, Lord, that you would just touch our hearts so that we could be patient uh, when we're waiting for you. And when you say go, that we could be passionate and do it with all of our heart, with all of our might, with all of our strength. I thank you that there's direction right now. I thank you that you're uh, speaking clearly right now and you're moving in someone. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you so much for joining us and um, God bless you.